Hello, dear students. My name is Irina Stitsuk, and I'm happy to give your consideration the lecture called Syndromological Curing Approach for Children Under 5 Years Old by the Department of General Practice, Family Medicine of Zaporizhia State Medical University. 2.6 million babies die every year in their first month of life, and a similar number are stillborn. Within the first month, up to half of all deaths occur within the first 24 hours of life, and 75% occur in the first week. The 48 hours immediately following birth is the most crucial period for newborn survival. This is when mother and child should receive quality follow-up care to prevent and treat illness. Globally, the number of neonatal deaths declined from 5.1 million in 1990 to 2.6 million in 2016. However, the decline in neonatal mortality from 1990 to 2016 has been slower than that of postneonatal under 5 mortality, 49% compared with 62% globally. The relative decline in the neonatal mortality rate was slower in sub-Saharan Africa. The modest decline in neonatal mortality in this region was offset by increasing number of births, so that the number of neonatal deaths remained almost the same from 1990 to 2016. Moreover, 52 countries need to accelerate progress to reach SDG target of neonatal mortality rate of 12 deaths per 100 live births by 2030. Prior to birth, a mother can increase her child's chance of survival and good health by attending antenatal care consultations, being immunized against tetanus and avoiding smoking and use of alcohol. At the time of birth, a baby's chance of survival increases significantly with delivery in a health facility in the presence of a skilled birth attendant. After birth, essential care for newborn should include ensuring that the baby is breathing, starting the newborn on exclusive breastfeeding right away, keeping the baby warm, and washing hands before touching the baby. Identifying and caring for illnesses in a newborn is very important, as a baby can become very ill and die quickly if an illness is not recognized and treated appropriately. Sick babies must be taken immediately to a trained health care provider. Substantial global progress has been made in reducing child deaths since 1990. Since 1990, the global under-5 mortality rate has dropped 56%. Although the world as a whole has been accelerating progress in reducing the under-5 mortality rate, disparities exist in under-5 mortality across regions and countries. Sub-Saharan Africa remains the region with the highest under-5 mortality rate in the world, with one child in 13 dying before his or her fifth birthday. Inequity also persists within countries geographically or by social economic status. More than half of under five children deaths are due to diseases that are preventable and treatable through simple, affordable interventions. Strengthening health systems to provide such interventions to all children will save many young lives. Malnourished children, particularly those with severe acute malnutrition, have a higher risk of death from common childhood illness, such as diarrhea, pneumonia, and malaria. Nutrition-related factors contributed to about 45% or death in children under 5 years of age. Leading causes of death in postneonatal children and risk factors are shown on the next slide. As you can see, the two most important causes of death of respiratory infections and childhood diarrhea. The risk factors include low birth weight, malnutrition, absence of breastfeeding, overcrowded conditions, unsafe drinking water and food, and poor hygiene practices. Congenital animalities, injuries, 
and non-communicable diseases are the emerging priorities in the global child health agenda. Congenital animalities affect an estimated 1 in 33 infants, resulting in 3.2 million children with disabilities related to birth defects every year. The global disease burden due to the non-communicable diseases affecting children in childhood and later in life is rapidly increasing, even though many of the risk factors can be prevented. Injuries, including road traffic injuries, drowning, burns, and falls, rank among the top causes of death and lifelong disability among children aged 5 through 14 years. The patterns of death in older children and adolescents reflect the underlying risk profiles of an age group, with a shift away from infectious diseases of childhood and towards accidents and injuries, notably drowning and road traffic injuries for older ch children and adolescents. Similarly, the worldwide number of overweight children increased, including in countries with a high prevalence of childhood undernutrition. Every day, millions of parents seek health care for their sick children, taking them to hospitals, health centers, pharmacies, doctors, and traditional healers. Surveys reveal that many sick children are not properly assessed and treated uh, by these health care providers and that their parents are poorly advised. Limited supplies and equipment, combined with an irregular flow of patients, leave health workers at the first level with few opportunities to practice complicated clinical procedures. Instead, they often rely on history and signs and symptoms to determine a course of management that makes the best use of available resources. These factors make providing quality care to sick children a serious challenge. World Health Organization and UNICEF have addressed this challenge by developing a strategy called the Integrated Management of Childhood Illnesses, IMCI. According to the World Health Organization, IMCI is an integrated approach to child health that focuses on the well-being of the whole child. IMCI aims to reduce death, illness, and disability and to promote improved growth and development among children under 5 years of age. IMCI includes both preventive and curative elements that are implemented by families and communities, as well as by health facilities. The strategy includes the three main components. Improving case management skills of healthcare staff, improving overall health systems, Improving family and community health practices. In health facilities, the IMCI strategy promotes the accurate identification of childhood illnesses in outpatient settings, ensures appropriate combined treatment of all major illnesses, strengthens the counseling of caretakers, and speed up the referral of severity ill children. In some home setting, it promotes appropriate care-seeking behaviors, improved nutrition and preventive care, and the correct implementation of prescribed care. The assessment of babies has the following components. Diarrhea, the breastfeeding low body mass, the immunization status, or other conditions. The presence of disease or local bacterial infection is assessed by lack of, lack of breastfeeding, seizure, increased respiration rate more than 60 per 1 minute, significant chest retraction, movement after stimulation or absence of independent movements, fever, hypermia around umbilical wound or manure, pustules on the skin. Neonatal jaundice or neonatal hyperbilirubinemia or neonatal ictus is the yellowing of the skin and other tissues of a newborn infant. A bilirubin level of more than 5 mg per deciliter leads to a jaundiced appearance in neonates. In newborns, jaundice is detected by blanching the skin with pressure applied by a finger so that it reveals underlying skin and subcutaneous tissue. 
Jaundice newborns have yellow discoloration of the white part of the eye and yellowing of the face, extending down under the chest and then to the extremities. Neonatal jaundice can make the newborn sleepy and interfere with feeding. Extreme jaundice can cause permanent brain damage. This condition is common in newborns, affecting over half of all babies in the first week of life. In infants, jaundice can be measured using invasive and non-invasive methods. Any of the following features characterizes pathological jaundice. Clinical jaundice appearing in the first 24 hours or greater than 14 days of life. Increases in the level of total bilirubin by more than 0.5 mg per deciliter per hour or 5 mg per deciliter per 24 hours. Total bilirubin for more than 19.5 mg per deciliter. Direct bilirubin more than 2.0 mg per deciliter. Diarrhea is the sudden increase in the frequency and looseness of stools. Mild diarrhea is the passage of a few loose or mushy stools. Severe diarrhea is the passage of many watery stools. Watery stools that occur every hour are definitely severe diarrhea. The best indicator of the severity of the diarrhea is its frequency of blood in the stools. The main complication of diarrhea is dehydration from the loss of too much fluid from the body. Symptoms of dehydration are dry mouth, the absence of tears, unfrequent urination, for example, non eight hours, and a darker concentrated urine. The main goal of diarrhea treatment is to prevent dehydration. Increased fluids and dietary changes are the main treatment for diarrhea. The child's health care provider has to be called if there are signs of dehydration, no urine in more than 8 hours, very dry mouth, no tears. Any blood appears in the diarrhea. The diarrhea is severe. The diarrhea is watery and your child vomits repeatedly. Your child starts acting very sick. Early breastfeeding is associated with fever nighttime feeding problems. Early skin-to-skin -skin contact between mother and baby improves breastfeeding outcomes and increases cardiorespiratory stability. Breastfeeding aids general health, growth, and development in the infant. Infants who are not breastfed are at mildly increased risk of developing acute and chronic diseases, including lower respiratory infection, ear infections, bacteremia, bacterial meningitis, botulism, urinary tract infection, and necrotizing enterocolitis. Breastfeeding may protect against sudden infant death syndrome, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, lymphoma, allergic diseases, digestive diseases, obesity, developed diabetes, or childhood leukemia later in life, and may enhance cognitive development. The average breastfed baby doubles its birth weight in 5-6 months. By one year, a typical breastfed baby weighs about 2.5 times its birth weight. And one-year breastfed babies tend to be leaner than formula-fed babies, which improve long-run long health. Length gain and head circumference values are also better in the breastfed babies. Extended breastfeeding means breastfeeding after the age of 12 or 24 months, depending on the source. For newborns, breast milk can help protect against many diseases. It contains antibodies passed from the mother. However, the immunity wears off within a year, and many children aren't breastfed to begin with. In both cases, vaccines can help protect babies and small children from disease. They can also help prevent the spread of disease to older children and adults. Vaccines imitate infection or a certain disease in the body. This prompts the immune system to develop weapons called antibodies. These antibodies uh, help fight the disease that the vaccine 
is meant to prevent. With them in place, your body can defeat any future infection with the disease. Vaccines are available for some of the most deadly childhood diseases, such as measles, polio, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, pneumonia due to hemophilus influenza type B, and streptococcus pneumonia, and diarrhea due to rotavirus. Vaccines can protect children from illness and death. The recommended vaccination timeline is shown on the next slide. As you can see, the first six months is the most important period when a child gets most part of the vaccinations. For the outpatient curing of children aged 2 months, 5 years, first of all, we have to collect the medical history from the parents of a child, symptoms, food, medical care. After that goes the physical exam. Red flags are seizure, conscious, breastfeeding, vomiting. We are checking a child for the main symptoms. Cough or breathing disorder, diarrhea, hyperthermia, problem with ear. A cough in children may be either a normal physiological reflex or due to an underlying cause. In healthy children, it may be normal in the absence of any disease to cough 10 times a day. The most common cause of an acute or subacute cough is a viral respiratory tract infections. The causes of chronic cough are similar in children with the addition of bacterial bronchitis. The treatment of cough in children is based on the underlying cause. In children, half of cases go away without treatment in 10 days and 90% in 25 days. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, the use of cough medicine to relieve cough symptoms is supported by little evidence and thus not recommended for treating cough symptoms in children. Diarrhea is the condition of having at least three loose or liquid bowel movements each day. It often lasts for a few days and can result in dehydration due to fluid loss. Signs of dehydration often begin with loss of the normal stretchiness of the skin and irritable behavior. This can progress to decreased urination, a loss of skin color, a fast heart rate, and a decrease in responsiveness as it becomes more severe. Loose but non-watery stools in babies who are breastfed, however, may be normal. Acute diarrhea is the most commonly due to viral gastroenteritis with rotavirus, which accounts for 40% of cases in children under 5. In many cases of diarrhea, replacing lost fluid and salts in only, is the only treatment needed. This is usually by mouth, oral rehydration therapy, or in severe cases, intravenously. Medications such as loperamide or bismuth salicylate may be beneficial. However, they may be contraindicated in certain situations. Fever is a normal response to a variety of conditions the most common of which is infection. In general, a fever means a temperature above 38 degrees Celsius. The best way to measure a child's temperature depends, depends upon several factors. In all children, a rectal temperature is the most accurate. However, it is possible to accurately measure the temperature in the mouth for children older than 4 or 5 years when the proper technique is used. Temperatures measured in the armpit are less accurate but may be useful as a first test in an infant who is younger than 3 months or an older child who cannot hold the thermometer under his or her tongue. If the armpit temperature is over 37.2 degrees, the rectal temperature should be measured. Temperatures measured in the ear or on the forehead also are less accurate than temperatures measured rectally or orally and may need to be confirmed by one of these methods. It is not accurate to measure a child's temperature by feeling the child's skin. This is called a tactile temperature and it is slightly dependent upon the temperature of the person who is feeling the child's skin. Nearly every child will develop a fever at some point. The challenge for the parents is to know when to be concerned.
Infection is the most common cause of fever in children. Common viral and bacterial illnesses like colds, gastroenteritis, ear infections, croup, bronchiolitis, and urinary tract infections are the most likely illnesses to cause fever. There is little or no scientific evidence to support the widespread belief that teething causes fever. Although it is difficult to disprove this notion completely, alternative causes of fever should always be sought, and temperatures above 38.9 degrees should never be attributed to teething. Bundling a child who is less than three months old in too many clothes or blankets can increase the child's temperature slightly. However, a rectal temperature of 38.5 degrees or greater is not likely to be related to bundling and should be evaluated. Some childhood immunizations can cause fever. The timing of the fever varies depending upon which vaccination was given. A healthcare provider should be consulted in the following situations. Infants who are less than three months of age who have a rectal temperature of 38 degrees or greater, regardless of how the infant appears. These patients should not receive fever medications until they are consulted with their health care provider. Children who are three months or to three years who have a rectal temperature of 38 degrees or greater for more than three days or who appear ill. Children who are from 3 to 36 months who have a rectal temperature of 38.9 or greater. Children of any age whose oral, rectal, tympanic membrane or forehead temperature is 40 degrees or greater or whose axillary temperature is 39.4 or greater. Children of any age who have a febrile seizure. Febrile seizures are convulsions that occur when a child between 6 months and 6 years of age has a temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius. Children of any age who have recurrent fevers for more than 7 days, even if the fevers last only a few hours. Children of any age who have a fever and have a chronic medicinal problem, such as heart disease, cancer, lupus, or sickle cell anemia. Children who have a fever as well as new skin rash. Treatment of fever is recommended if a child has an underlying medical problem including diseases of heart, lung, brain, or nervous system. In children who have had febrile seizures in the past, treatment of fever has not been shown to prevent seizures, but is still a reasonable precaution. Treatment of fever may be helpful if the child is uncomfortable, although it is not necessary. In most cases, it is not necessary to treat a child's fever. A child older than 3 months who has a rectal temperature less than 38.9 degrees and who is otherwise healthy and acting normally does not require treatment for fever. Parents who are unsure if their child's fever needs treatment should contact the child's health care provider. Fever treatment options include the following. Medications. The most effective way to treat fever is to use a medication such as acetaminophen or ibuprofen. These treatments can reduce the child's discomfort and lower the child's temperature. Aspirin is not recommended for children under age 18 years due to concerns that it can cause a rare but serious illness known as Ray syndrome. Increased fluids. To reduce the dehydration risk, parents should encourage their child to drink an adequate amount of fluids. Fluids such as milk, formula, and water should be offered frequently. If the child is unwilling or unable to drink fluids for more than a few hours, the parent should consult the child's health care provider. Rest. Having a fever causes most children to feel tired and itchy. During this time, parents should encourage their child to rest as much as the child wants. It is not necessary to force the child to sleep or rest if he or she begins to feel better. Children may return to school or other activities when the temperature has been normal for 24 hours. Ear infections. 
also called otitis media, are a common problem in children. Otitis media is an infection of the middle section of the ear. Most of the time it is caused by bacteria that nearly all children have in their nose and throat at one time or another. Ear infections most often develop after the viral respiratory tract infection, such as cold or flu. Ear infections can cause pain in the ear, fever, and temporary he hearing loss and general signs, such as loss of appetite or irritability. Some children get better without specific antibiotic treatment, but most young infants benefit from use of the antimicrobial agent. In infants and young children, symptoms of an ear infection can include fever, pulling on the ear, fuziness or irritability, decreased activity, lack of appetite or difficulty eating, vomiting or diarrhea, draining fluid from the outer ear called arteria. Treatment of an ear infection may include antibiotics, medicines to treat pain and fever, observation, a combination of all of the above. The best treatment depends on the child's age, history of previous infections, degree of illness, and any underlying medical problem. Antibiotics are routinely given to infants who are younger than 24 months or who have high fever or infection of both ears. Children who are older than 24 months and have mild symptoms may be treated with an antibiotic or often are observed to see if they improve without antibiotics. The term croup is used to describe a variety of respiratory illnesses in children. It mostly occurs in infants and young children between 6 months and 3 years of age and is less commonly seen in children older than 6 years. It is usually seen in fall and early winter months. The most common cause of croup is a viral infection, such as parainfluenza or influenza, that leads to swelling of the larynx and trachea. The primary symptoms of croup are a barking cough and hoarseness, high-pitched noisy breathing called strider. Symptoms are usually worse at night. Most children develop a fever which may range from mild to very high. Other symptoms such as rush, eye redness and swollen lymph nodes may develop depending upon the virus causing the illness. Dehydration can occur if the children, child is not able to drink enough fluids. Low oxygen levels called hypoxia and blue tinged skin called cyanosis can develop as air flow to the lungs is restricted. Croup can be mild moderate or severe. Uh, the child may appear anxious, agitated or fatigued and it depends on how difficult it is for the infant or child to pull air into the lungs. The size of the windpipe and degree of narrowing due to the swelling are important determinants of severity. Croup may become more severe when a child becomes agitated or upset. Croup is usually diagnosed based on the, upon the child's symptoms and signs, including a barking cough and strider, especially if these findings occur during the fall and winter months. X-ray and laboratory testing are rarely needed. The treatment of croup depends upon the severity of symptoms and the risk of rapid worsening. Children with mild symptoms who have no risk factors for rapid worsening generally are treated at home while a child with moderate to severe symptoms or who is at risk for rapid worsening should be treated in an emergency department. Common cold is one of the most common illnesses. Infants and children are affected more often and experience more prolonged symptoms than adults. The common cold is a group of symptoms caused by a number of different viruses. There are more than 100 different varieties of rhinovirus the type of virus responsible for the greatest number of colds. Either viruses can cause colds include enteroviruses and coronaviruses. Children under 6 years have an average 6 to 8 colds per year, with symptoms lasting an average of 14 days. 
The common cold may occur at any time of the year, although most colds occur during the fall and winter months, regardless of the geographic location. Colds are not caused by cold climates or being exposed to cold air. Colds are transmitted from person to person, either to direct contact or by contact with the virus in the environment. Colds are most contagious during the first two or four days. The main pathways for transmission are direct contact. People with colds typically carry the cold virus on their hands, where it is capable of infecting another person for at least two hours. If a child with a cold touches another child or adult, who when then touches their eye, nose, or mouth, the virus can later infect that person. Infection from particles and surfaces. Some cold viruses can live on surfaces for up to one day. Inhaling viral particles. Droplets containing viral par particles can be exhaled into the air by breathing or coughing. Rhinoviruses are not usually transmitted as a result of a contact with infected droplets, although influenza virus and coronavirus can be transmitted via small droplets. Cold viruses are not usually spread through saliva. The signs and symptoms of a cold usually begin one to two days after the exposure. In children, nasal congestion is one of the most prominent symptoms. Children can also have clear, yellow, or green-colored nasal discharge. Fever is common during the first three days of the illness. Other symptoms may include sore throat, cough, irritability, difficulty sleeping, and decreased appetite. The lining of the nose may become red and swollen, and the lymph nodes in the neck may become slightly enlarged. The symptoms of the cold are usually worse during the first 10 days. In addition, it is not usual for a child to develop a second cold as the symptoms of the first cold are resolving. This is not a cause for concern unless the child has any of the more serious symptoms. Most children who have colds do not develop complications. However, parents should be aware of the sounds of symptoms of potential complications. Ear infection. Between 5 and 19 percent of children with a cold develop a bacterial or viral ear infection. If a child develops a fever after the first three days of cold symptoms, an ear infection may be to blame. Asthma. Colds can cause wheezing in children who have not wheezed before or worsening of asthma in children who have a history of this condition. Sinusitis. Children who have nasal congestion that does not improve over the course of 10 days may have a bacterial sinus infection. Pneumonia. Children who develop a fever after the first three days of cold symptoms may have bacterial pneumonia, especially if the child also has a cough and is breathing rapidly. Common cold treatment includes the following components. Symptomatic treatment. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration FDA advisory panel has recommended against the use of antihistamines, decongestants, cough medicines, and expectorants alone and in combinations in children younger than 6 years. These medications are not proven to be effective and have the potential to cause dangerous side effects. Parents may give acetaminophen to treat a child older than 3 months who is uncomfortable because of fever during the first few days of a cold. Ibuprofen can be given to children older than 6 months. Aspirin should be not given to any child under age of 18 years. Humidified air may improve symptoms of nasal congestion and runny nose. For infants, parents can try saline nose drops to thin the mucus, followed by bulb suction to temporarily remove nasal secretion. An older child may try using a saline nose spray. Honey may be helpful for nighttime cough in children older than 12 months. Parents should encourage their child to drink an adequate amount of fluids. If an infant or child completely refuses to eat or drink for a prolonged period, the parent should contact their child's health care provider.
Antibiotics are not effective in treating colds. They may be necessary if the cold is complicated by a bacterial infection, like an ear infection, pneumonia, or sinusitis. Parents who think their child has developed one of these infections should contact their child health care provider. Inappropriate use of antibiotics can lead to the development of antibiotic resistance and can possibly lead to side effects such as allergic reaction. Herbal and alternative treatment. A number of alternative products, including zinc and herbal products such as echinacea, are advertised to treat or prevent common cold. There is some evidence that prophylactic use of vitamin C may decrease the duration of the common cold in children. With the exception of vitamin C, none of these treatments have been proven to be effective in clinical trials. Their use is not recommended. Common cold prevention. Simple hygiene measures can help to prevent infection with the viruses that cause colds. These measures include Hand washing is an essential and highly effective way to prevent the spread of infection. Hands should be wet with water and plain soap and rubbed together from 15 to 30 seconds. It is not necessary to use antibacterial hand soap. Teach children to wash their hands before and after eating and after coughing or sneezing. Alcohol-based hand rubs are a good alternative for disinfecting hands if the sink is not available. Hand rubs should be spread over the entire surface of hands, fingers, and wrists until dry and may be used several times. These rubs can be used repeatedly without skin irritation or loss of effectiveness. It may be difficult or impossible to completely avoid people who are ill, although parents should try to limit direct contact. Most children with colds need to be excluded from daycare or school. It is likely that they spread the virus before they developed cold symptoms. Using a household cleaner that kills viruses such as phenol alcohol, sample brand name Lizol, may help to reduce viral transmission. As a conclusion, I would like to say that children brought for medical treatment in the developing world are often suffering from more than one condition, making a single diagnosis impossible. IMCI is an integrated strategy which takes into account the variety of factors that put children at serious risk. It ensures the combined treatment of the major childhood illnesses, emphasizing prevention of disease through immunization and improved nutrition. Thank you for your attention.